<clears throat> apologies for my hoarse voice, which is the result of a lingering kind of laryngitis. I also have to apologize for moving very quickly uh, among these slides because there is a vast amount of material on these incunables and I want to give you as uh, full a panorama as, as possible. Um, in April 1490, Pomponio Leto, professor at the Studium Morbus and head of the Sodalitas, uh, commonly known today as the Roman Academy, published a new edition of Salas Opera, including especially his two monographs, The Conspiracy of Catiline and The Jugurthine War. Preceding the text was a dedicatory letter of Pomponio to Agostino Maffei, his longtime friend, patron, and collector of manuscripts and antiquities. The choice of Sallust was not surprising, for Sallust monographs have been part of the school canon since antiquity. Now, data in this table compiled many years ago would need to be updated for the later periods. But for the period 1470 or 1500, the current data in the ISTC gives us a very similar picture of the relative popularity of Sallust compared to other Roman historians. In the 15th century, Sallust clearly headed the bestseller list of Roman historians and did so from most of the Renaissance. A new edition of Sallust, therefore, was not in itself unusual. But what made this 1490 edition important was Pomeo, Pomponio's name and reputation as one of the leading classical scholars of his age. In the epistle to Maffei, he says that he has been preparing this edition for some three years, collating old manuscripts and emending the text. The 1490 imprint was soon considered an authoritative edition. Pomponio's work on Salas did not end with editing and publishing the text. Sometime after the date of printing, April 1490, he filled the margins of his own copy, now in the Vatican Library, Rossiana 441, with extensive marginal notes and occasional interlinear glosses on the text of the Catiline and Jugurtha. Now, if you can't read these notes very well, which are very faded, it is not surprising because unfortunately, a later owner who evidently thought that marginalia disfigured the pages of this book did his best to wash them away. Pomponio also attached to his personal copy little leaflets, fasciculetti, containing additional notes summaries, extracts, lists of sources on various topics of Roman history and antiquities. In this case, um, several pages, there are 15, about 15, no, actually more than that, about 20 in all, um, some seven or eight on the subject of De Historia, um, historiography in uh, Roman and, and um, in the Greek periods, and uh, another set of notes on the name of the city of Rome, the foundation of Rome, the early inhabitants of Rome, and other aspects of early Roman history. Now, these manuscript notes, both the marginal notes and the um, additional essays bound with the volume were never printed. We don't even know if Pomponio ever used this copy in his teaching, whether at the university or privately. Certainly though, 
the commentary was read and transcribed in the following years by several persons, whether students, former students, or members and friends of his in his Sodalitas, his literary group that was based at his own house uh, on the Quirinal. Two of these copies appear to have been transcribed directly from Pomponio's autograph. The copy at the Morgan Library, very similar to the Rossiano, was perhaps intended as a fair copy. You can see, for instance, where the copyist of the Morgan Library has inserted um, a sentence that Pomponio had added perhaps at the last minute to his paragraph um, uh, on the, the, the left um, in the margin. Another Vatican incunable, which has recently been acquired by the Vatican only a few years ago, also exhibits a similar though independent version of the Rossiano. Now, there are three other copies which I have come across in the past 10 or 15 years, which show more variations with passages added, modified, or omitted. Their relationship with Pomponio's autograph and to each other require further study. The copy of the Biblioteca Civica in Fermo, the Biblioteca Estense in Modena, and at Glasgow, the University Library. In addition to these six incunables, we even have an annotated manuscript. Um, now at the Kloster Neustadt near Bresanone, which I have seen um, only in microfilm at the Biblioteca Nazionale in Rome. It contains both a copy, a handwritten copy of Pomponio's printed text of Sala's two monographs and a version of the marginal and interlinear notes, evidently transcribed simultaneously concurrently from one of the already annotated printed copies. Now, let's suppose that we want to produce an edition or editions of this commentary. Uh, it would be important to publish given both its author and content or that we simply want to investigate as a case study in the editing of student, or since we don't know if these were students, um, we could say more generally readers' notes. Uh, this raises, of course, a lot of questions. And I want to cite um, an observation by Marjorie Woods and in reference to editing medieval commentaries. However, I think it's very appropriate, very um, relevant to this situation here. And that is what she calls the uneasy relationship between the kinds of information we may want from an edition of a commentary and the possible methods of editing it. Let us start, however, by asking what kind of information we would like to obtain from an edition of Pomponio's commentary. Do we want to recover Pomponio's original version, the authorial text? This choice would highlight Pomponio's particular interest as scholar and his own innovative methods as teacher. Now, during most of the Renaissance, through the 15th century, I should say, sorry, during most of the Middle Ages, through the 15th century and beyond, the commentaries on Salas followed a simple pedagogical format, proceeding line by line, even word by word, 
concentrating on basic grammatical and lexical explanations, paraphrases of difficult words, notes on rhetorical constructions, brief identifications of persons and events, sententia and exempla. Pomponio followed a similar method in his lectures of the University on Salas to Goethe in 1480, 10 years earlier. As we see in, in a commentary taken down from dictation by a German student, where the lemmata are underlined in red and the brief notes explain race and verba, content and language. We see this format too in the first printed edition of the Catiline in 1491, attributed, though perhaps mistakenly, to Lorenzo Valla. But Pomponio's notes in the Rossiano and in the copies of his 1490 edition are much more selective. And they focus chiefly on topics of Roman history, law, religion, and topography. The notes on this page, for instance, summarize events in the early Republic, that is, the secessions of the plebs to Monte Sacro, to the Aventine, and the creation of the Office of Tribunes. Moreover, Pomponio's sources range widely from the major Roman and Greek historians, which he would have read in Latin translations, to less familiar authors, historians, but also poets, grammarians, geographers, lexicographers, who had never been cited before or very rarely in the common tradition, at least on Salas. In contrast to the 1480 commentary, which appears to be the product of a classroom lecture taken down by dictation. The 1490 commentary reflects, as Robert Ullery pointed out in an earlier article, a rather sophisticated audience or readership, not, and I quote, neophytes encountering Salustian narrative as a part of their basic education in the Latin language, but rather more like the participants in an advanced seminar. If we take into account the notes in the separate leaves appended to Pomponio's autograph and also to the Morgan, Modena and second Vatican copies, we can also see how these notes it provided a kind of context for the marginal, the shorter marginal notes, um, especially on topics in Salas proems and digressions. Here, for example, Salas' role as historian illustrates certain modes and concepts of ancient historiography, the writing of contemporary or recent history, as in his two monographs, as opposed to um, histories, especially analytic histories, on ancient or more remote events. The historian's duty to truth, and uh, a theme that was especially dear to both Sallust and Pomponio, the dignity of the historian who deserves as much respect as the protagonist of the events he describes. Now, Salah's account also illustrates certain political, social, and cultural policies that interested Pomponio, especially Rome's policy of welcome and assimilating foreigners into the city of Rome, and which he expands upon in other comments that I uh, don't have here at the moment. Also admitting new men, homines novi, into the Senate. Factors that contributed, Pomponio believed, to the growth, expansion, and success of the Roman state. An observation that, as we know, re <laughs> can resonate 
with issues of immigration in our own society today. But let us consider another choice. Suppose we want to concentrate on the reception and diffusion of the commentary, the way in which it evolved as it was read, interpreted, and continuously altered, re-edited, re-authored, we could say, with each new transcription, with each new reader, preserving characteristic features of Pomponio's original, but adapted to each reader's own priorities and reading habits. And here we should consider various copy specific features. The manuscript annotations, that is the layout and appearance on the page, the characteristics of the hands, decoration, additional material bound with the, uh, the printed edition marks of ownership or provenance. Here we see, for example, the spatial arrangement of the notes on a page, which I believe suggests a very careful and deliberate process of annotation. And the conscious imitation of certain erudite features of Pomponio's handwriting the epigraphic capitals or the random use of capital letters within or at the beginning of words, the characteristic diphthong and ampersand, and of course, the famous Pomponian, Pomponian or Ancil G. Imitating Pomponio's distinctive hand was, I would say, a kind of what could, he, could we call it today? A kind of brand recognition, a way that these readers and copyists could link themselves to Pomponio, associate themselves with Pomponio and his circle, and very proudly so. The modern Ethiopia is handsomely decorated with fine pen work and colored inks and flourished borders, and like the Fermo copy with illuminated or permanent initials. We also have additional manuscript material, not only the comments on uh, historiography and Roman antiquities, but other. Um, fragments, other pieces that provide clues that have been bound with the copy, in this case, the modern copy, which is especially interesting, I believe, which provide clues about the owners, but also about the way books were used as handy reference books on ancient institutions and customs. We could say, little portable libraries of ancient history. Attached to the modern exemplar is the copy of a letter from Pomponio to his friend and fellow humanist, Vazino Gambera or Gamberia, introducing a little booklet entitled De Nominibus Mencium. Translate, translated, Pomponio himself tells us, from the Arabic on the names of the months in use among ancient peoples, the Egyptians and Hebrews, up to the Romans and Arabs, with a short description at the end of the Islamic calendar. It is interesting, by the way, that the same manuscript or another witness was seen in Pomponio's library in 1493 by a young humanist from Vercelli, Ludovico Tizzone, who made two copies of it in his own Michelania, now in the Biblioteca Universitaria of Turin, and which fortunately uh, barely escaped the terrible fire at the Turin Library in the early 1900s. The Moderna Incunable also contains another interesting piece of information. This is a parchment bifolium 
that originally served as the wrapper. It's a fragment, only a fragment of an account, which I have not yet located, um, in an earlier humanist hand of what seems to have been Rodrigo Borges' embassy to Naples in, seven, in September 1477 as papal legate, thus revealing possible links to the entourage of Cardinal Borgia, future Pope Alexander VI. According to what has been called Christeller's Law, it is the single rarest item in a humanist miscellany that can often supply valuable evidence regarding the provenance of a collection. Two other copies of the 1490 edition contain only occasional uh, notes, not by any means the full commentary of, uh, from Pomponio's Rossiano or copies, but they too provide close, they have further clues to the owners and readers of this work. A copy in Nice bears a coat of arms that has been identified with the Borgia family. And we know that Pomponio's young friend and later fellow teacher, Paolo Pompilio, had served as tutor to the young Cesare Borgia, whose copy this may have been. Pomponio himself dedicated his Romana Historia Compendium to uh, Francesco Borgia, a cousin of the Pope. This beautiful copy in the Roman library at Copenhagen boasts a coat of arms that can be traced to the Stati or Stati Tamarossi, a family of the municipal aristocracy of Rome. The initials L and S in the upper left and lower corners of the historiated initial probably stand for Lucius Sergius, the prinomena nomen of Catalan, the protagonist of Salus Monograph. But they could also have referred to a member of the Stati family whose first name began with L. Uh, there was, in fact, a Lorenzo Stati, whose name appears in documents of the 15th century. And a young member of the family, Alessio Stati, is known to have been a student of Pomponio. Uh, the notes themselves may possibly be in the hand of, uh, again, Pomponio's friend and fellow teacher, uh, Paolo Pompilio. Now, if some of you have been in Rome, you may recognize the Palazzo Stati, um, built slightly later, uh, designed by Giulio Romano. But interestingly enough, well, it's better known today as the site of the famous bar, a coffee bar, Santa Eustachio. And it looks as if in the 18th century, there may have been a bar there too. Uh, Pomponio may have stopped there or around there for a coffee because after all the Studium Orbis, um, which was located in what is now the site of the Chiesa uh, di San Ivo, is just up the street from here. To conclude, how might we correlate aims and methods? If, for instance, the aim is to recover Pomponio's original version, one might attempt a traditional schematic method. But then what do we use for the base text? The Rossiano 441, which is barely legible today, even with a UV lamp, or another, presumably one that is closest to Pomponio's. Or if one chooses the second route, that is focusing on the readers themselves, one might select a single text or a selection of texts, or we might want each commentary to speak for itself. 
I ended with the scene, Arundella. Um, in this scene, the characters, the main characters, the stepdaughter and the father, are arguing passionately about whose part, whose drama is going to be represented. The daughter cries out, I want to act my part, my part. The director or manager replies, ah, just your part. But if you will pardon me, there are other parts than yours. The fathers, the mothers. On the stage, you can have a character becoming too prominent and overshadowing all the others. The thing is to pack them all into a neat little framework and then act what is actable. I am aware of the fact that everyone has his own interior life which he wants very much to put forward. But the difficulty lies in this fact, to set out just so much as is necessary for the stage, taking the other characters into consideration and at the same time hint at the unrevealed interior life of each. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Trisha, for uh, your great overview of all these magnificent annotated uh, cells co copies. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit late, so I, 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 I want just one good question. So, uh, are there? Is there anyone? Well, yeah, Luigi. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. This was really a wonderful presentation. I, I do not have a good question, uh, but I have a question indeed, uh, which is uh, indeed about one of the manuscripts you showed us, uh, the manuscript in Torino. As, as I live there, I, I would like to maybe propose its study to one of my students. Uh, do you think it's interesting it's uh, it's something you're really working on uh it, it's just a fragment because as you know many of our manuscripts were burned in the 1904 fire it's just a couple of uh, uh folia or quaterniones or there's more thanks no this is a very large uh manuscript i do have um thanks to a friend in Turin. Um, uh, quite a collection of images from it, which I would be glad to share with you um, if we can stay in touch. It certainly deserves to be studied and compared with the version in the Modena copy. Uh, the relationship is complicated, um, but I would be glad to um, tell you what work has been done, um, which is uh, by a young scholar, um, or Arabic scholar in Venice, who, however, can probably not um, pursue this. So uh, <laughs> we would certainly welcome an editor of this. And if uh, you work in Islamic studies yourself um, and Islamic chronology, which is essential to this, or maybe a colleague, it would be a fascinating uh, project. Okay, uh, Mark, very quickly, please. Thank you very much. I'll keep this very brief. Uh, uh, Patricia, you were commenting about the, uh, the advanced scholarly level of some of these notes, uh, far beyond the elementary, so to speak. Um, now, I was uh, thinking, because, but they're still in a lematic structure, basically. Now, I was thinking about the other uh, commentary tradition that comes up uh, in the late uh, Quattrocento, that is the essay format, which is almost always actually, uh, you know, beyond the elementary of a, you know, of a certain scholarly level. Now, my question is, uh, do you see any overlap 
between um, notes in lematic format and notes in this essay format. Uh, do these two traditions ever uh, sort of interconnect? Well, um, that's interesting, a point which I should give more thought to. Um, Pomponio himself, even in his lematic commentary, which is clearly a, a classroom uh, lecture um, on the Jugurtha in 1480, uh, does expatiate at times on some of the same topics that we find in his 1490 commentary. So they are longer and fuller passages. Um, uh, Pomponio, of course, also drew upon his other works, the De Magistratibus, um, his um, topographical surveys of Rome, too. Um, so I think there is in Pomponio's work a kind of intermixture. But in terms of the Salist commentary tradition itself, I don't see an evolution towards the essay type. And so um, this is, I would say, an exception. And it may account for the, re for the fact that it was never published. In other words, the, the commentaries that were published in the 1490s the one attributed to Lorenzo Valla, um, a Giovanni Christostomos, uh, Christostomos Soldos commentary on the Jugurtha, and then the Pseudepigraphum, which you know Ullery talked about in, in the conference in, in Bonn and was published in Your Notes Latina, um, which was actually. Um, taken from or adapted from a medieval commentary. They are all traditional um, pedagogical commentaries. And so it's not really, I'm thinking maybe not until, good heavens, Rivius or, or even later in the, in the um, 16th century that we find more expanded notes or essay types. But if you know of any, I would very much like to, to hear about them, to compare them. Thanks. OK. Again, thank you uh, for the brief but uh, interesting discussion.